above all else? We choose Christ. Above all else. Would you please stand in body or spirit with me as we join together in the call to worship? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. We will sing praises to our God as long as we live. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Happy are, are those, those whose, whose hope is, is in the, the Lord, Lord their, God. their God. And would you please join us as we sing We Three Kings, hymn number 254, or it's on the screen.
you join with me in prayer? God, our Creator, you make all things new in heaven and on earth. How good it is to know the comfort of your presence as a new year begins. There are new desires and old fears, new decisions and old controversies, new dreams and old weaknesses. Because, because you are a God, God of hope, hope. We, we know that, that you will be present, present in, all in all the possibilities of the future. future. Because, because you are a God, God of love, love. We, we know, know that you accept, accept all the mistakes, mistakes of the past. Because, because you are a God, God of our faith, faith. we enter your, your gates, gates with thanksgiving and praise. And praise. We come into your presence with gladness and joyful singing, and we serve and bless you in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. In the name of Jesus, the risen Christ, I greet you. Good morning and Happy New Year. Good morning. Would you turn and offer those who are standing near you a very Happy New Year this morning before taking your seats? Happy New Year. And a very good morning and happy new year to all who are with us in the online uh, format this morning. Two kinds of people on New Year's morning. Those who, when you say happy new year, return uh, the, uh, the cheer and say happy new year. And then those who say, oh, don't do that. Uh, and I hope that you are the former and not the latter. But if you are the latter, God still loves us and we are filled with grace upon grace. Amen. What a joy and a privilege to be with you in worship, to launch out our, our new year in ministry side by side. Uh, this year's theme for ministry is on the front of your bulletin, every day with God, not just the Sundays, not just at the Bible study on Wednesday, but every day with God. Hopefully you've brought your journal with you, and if not, when you get home, while it's still fresh in your mind, jot down a few notes on the Sunday page for how God is prompting and, uh, and provoking your spirit in our worship today and how God is comforting your soul. I want to make a couple of announcements. Number one, uh, the office is closed for New Year's Day tomorrow, uh, and so worship design will be on Tuesday at 11 this week. Those of you who are part of the worship design process, um, come on in at 11 and we'll, uh, we'll take a look at what's coming up. If you've not been part of that meeting, I do want to extend an invitation to you to participate uh, the many voices make for a lively conversation uh, each, each week when we gather. Also, next Saturday, speaking of worship, next Saturday we'll be hosting a takedown party for the Advent decorations uh, because at that time the season of Christmas tide will be uh, finished and so all of our decorations need to be carefully uh, removed and stored. And I uh, would love to see the same size party that we had to put them up to be here next coming Saturday. And as your pastor, I want to remind you and assure you that donuts and coffee will be in abundance. So come on down at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning and help us put things away. Um, and uh, it's really not a putting things away because Jesus said whoever puts their hand to the plow and looks behind them is not fit for the kingdom of God. 
So it's really anticipating and looking forward to what the season of Epiphany and Lent and Eastertide can bring to us as we gaze down the path. What am I forgetting this morning by way of announcements? I don't think there's... Oh, yes, there, there are uh, flowers here that the church is going to jealously guard and keep because they belong to us. But the ones out in the narthex are, if you have purchased um, poinsettias this year and have not picked them up, please do so. Following today's worship, uh, any that are not picked up will be moved out to the front of the flower beds in the church for passersby to help themselves so that our uh, volunteers don't need to keep coming down and watering them uh, over and over again. So please help make sure that a poinsettia finds a good home and uh, take care of that. That being said, this is really a remarkable time for us to gather on a New Year's Day in, in, pre, in the presence of one another or online and to make our vows to God to make the coming year a time of deep joy and gladness, of deep love and mercy and peace, a time of deep healing and forgiveness. So let's find that centered place and let's prepare our hearts as we sing together and hear the word of God. Thank um. First reading, a response of Psalm, Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise the Lord in the heights. Praise, Praise the Lord, all his angels. Praise the Lord, all his hosts. Praise the Lord, sun and moon. Praise the Lord, all shining stars. Praise the Lord highest heavens, and all waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, who commanded, and they were created. Who established them forever and ever, and fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters, and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and smoke, Stormy wind, fulfilling God's command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth. Young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, whose name alone is exalted, whose glory is above earth and heaven. God has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful ones, for the people of Israel who are near their God. Praise the Lord. And today's gospel lesson comes from Matthew, chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the ch child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem 
who were two years old or under. According to the time that he had learned from the wise men, then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks Amen. Be to And Miss Carol is here to share a word for children on this New Year's Day. Good morning. Good morning. Part of the Christmas story is the story of the wise men who traveled very far to see Jesus. So... I thought I would just talk a little bit about that this morning. Christmas is over, but why were these people called wise men? Where did they come from? And why did they bother to go see Jesus? We don't know a whole lot about them. The Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot, but we know that they came from very far away. We know that they had followed a very bright star that they had seen in the sky. And if they were called wise men, they probably were supposed to be very intelligent, very smart. They knew when they saw this star, something special was happening, and they were going to do something about it. They decided they were going to go see where this new king that they thought had been born was living. They wanted to find him. They wanted to know more about him. They wanted an opportunity to see him. But Think about it. This was a long time ago, boys and girls. Did they have an airplane to hop in or a train to jump on or a car to ride in? No. And it would take them a very long time. They weren't even sure exactly where they were going. They were just going to follow this star. Imagine what that would be like if your mom woke you up in the morning and said, we're going on a trip today. Hop in the car. We're not sure where we're going, but we're going to follow that star up there. Pretty exciting. But I'm sure it wasn't an easy trip. It took a long time. And they had to ride on a camel all that time. Crossed a lot of deserts and other places that probably weren't so much fun to be going through. But they were determined they were going to find that new king. Now, think about it. There are a lot of people today who are looking for Jesus, too. Did they have to follow a star to find him? Did they have to open up a road map, or plug in the GPS in their car. I'm sure you've heard about that from mom and dad. So how do they find Jesus? It's so much easier these days. I'll give you an example. I had a little boy in fifth grade, and he was very interested in acting and singing. God had gifted him with a very good voice. He managed to get a part in a movie with some very famous actors and actresses. He had to go travel to the southern part of the country, and he had to bring his suitcase and all his belongings with him, but he never went anywhere without his Bible. Noah was very much in love with Jesus, and he wanted everybody else to know about it. When they checked into the hotel, Noah and his mom, right next to them was standing, I won't name him, but a very famous movie actor, and he took a look at Noah and said, oh, are you in the film too? And Noah said, yeah. And then he looked and he saw Noah was putting a Bible down on the counter and he said, 
is that your Bible? And Noah said, yeah. Do you read the Bible? No, said this man. Um, he said, well, you know what? You should. And he handed him a Bible. And he said, here, take mine. I've got another one that my mom has. And you should read this. You really should. He took a look at him and he said, you know what? Maybe I will. <laughs> when Noah came back and told me about that, I thought, that's the way people find Jesus today. And we need to take every opportunity that we can to share Jesus in any way that we can. All we need to do is open up the Bible to find Jesus, everything we want to know about him. So have you ever thought about giving a Bible to a friend? Have you ever thought about telling them that they should read the Bible? Noah was brave enough to do that, and we can all be brave enough to do that too. Introduce people to Jesus. Have them get to know him. Have them get to be part of our Christian family. Have them be saved so they can go to heaven with everyone else who loves Jesus too. Let's pray about that. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that it's so much easier today to find Jesus. We don't have to travel a long distance. We don't have to do a lot of chores. We don't have to endure a lot of hardships. All we need to do is open our Bibles. Please help us to remember to share those Bibles with other people and to share Jesus with everyone that we possibly can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The old adage that it is more blessed to give than to receive is coupled in our faith with the reality that everything we have is received. And therefore, as the psalmist says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We claim no ownership, but a profound and beautiful stewardship together. And at this time, we begin the new year by making an offering of what we understand to be our responsible stewardship before the Lord. So I invite the ushers to come forward as Mike shares with us a beautiful ministry and offering of song. Long time ago in Bethlehem, so the Holy Bible says, Mary's boy child, Jesus Christ, he born on Christmas Day. While shepherds watch their flocks by night, they see a bright new shining star. And then they hear a choir sing, the music seemed to come from afar. When Joseph and his wife Mary came to Bethlehem that night, they find no place for to born the child. Not a single room was in sight. Then by and by they find a little nook in a stable all forlorn. In a manger cold and dark that night, Mary's little boy child was born. Then their three made wise men told the king, they heard the new king born. We want to bring him frankincense and myrrh from way of a farm. When old King Herod learned that news, he was mad as he could be. He tell the wise men, find the child that I may worship he. Long time ago in Bethlehem, so the Holy Bible say. Mary's boy child, Jesus Christ, he was born on Christmas Day. Born on Christmas Day. Born on Christmas Day.
loving and gracious God, who through your Son, Jesus, is making all things new. Continue in this new year to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, that all may be done according to your purpose and your vision. We make this offering, O Lord, as a sign of our love for you and for one another, and we ask you to bless it and consecrate it, that its use may be multiplied in the earth. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. And will you pray with me again? Now, gracious Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. Through Christ Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. One of the gifts of getting older, I am discovering, is that we have the opportunity to pile up many, many, many years of memories. And then we pray that God will give us the ability to retrieve them from time to time. Part of what I love about the ordinariness of church, the regularity of certain words and certain prayers and other things is just the line of a hymn or the expression of a prayer, the reading of a particular scripture can trigger a whole host of memories. And so many of those memories are so joyful at this time of year when families have gathered and those things that were so beautiful and miraculous when we were children come blossoming back to life and they comfort our souls. I had a loving aunt who every year made hard candies in the flavors of cinnamon and mint and uh, licorice. They were red, green, and yellow. And uh, she gifted Judy and I this year with um, the recipe, the, 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 the ancient family recipe, a photograph of it in her own handwriting of how to make these uh, candies that uh, are dusted with a little bit of powdered sugar. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, they're just wonderful. They they look like pieces of stained glass. Um, and Judy uh, made some of those during the break between Christmas and New Year's Day. And I put one of those pieces of candy in my mouth, and I was transported back to uh, the time when the adults were over to watch the football game on New Year's Eve and the fire was going in the fireplace in my, in my family room where I grew up and my brother and I were playing with the games and the toys that we had gotten for Christmas and it was just such a warm and beautiful feeling of security and of the rightness of the world in that moment. It was a truly blessed home that I grew up in hopefully for you too. And certainly a far stone's throw away from what Jesus, the young lad, went through with his parents. In fact, what all of the people of God went through. When these travelers from the east came, they paid homage to Jesus. And again, that word homage is such a trigger word. The Bible translates the word as worship, but they were paying homage to Jesus. Worship is a spiritual and a soulful event. Homage is a political statement, and that's what brings us into today's gospel reading. The madness and the tyranny of Herod, the fear that struck and froze his heart, to kneel down and pay homage to somebody is to say, I am your man or woman. My allegiance is to you. I pledge allegiance to this babe in the manger. It was a powerful political statement for these people to come from an entirely other country and say, here is where my allegiance lies. Your Highness, we want to go and pay homage to the one who is going to be your replacement one day. And the king went berserk as kings often do when they feel their realm is threatened. Many years later, when Jesus' life and destiny were hanging in the balance, 
the high priest, Caiaphas, found on his lips that piece of wisdom from the Scriptures. Look, if we let this get out of hand with this Jesus guy, the Romans are really going to start cracking heads around here. So it's better for one person to die than for the entire nation to be placed in peril. This is the thinking of kings who believe that the kingdom is won by force and by show, and a show of power and strength. But I look back over the last century and I look at the nations who lost World War II and I see nothing but prosperity. How powerfully they have flourished in the after years. Germany, Japan, Italy, maybe not so much, but they have pasta, you know. So, yes. I, I learned to play chess many years ago, and I am a fiercely competitive person, although I don't always admit it. And in those first games, there's a moment when you realize there's, you're boxed in, there's nothing else, you're two, three, four moves away from obliteration. And I would find such a rage at the helplessness, and I fought against it to the point where as a small child or a young person, I would even want to just topple everything off the board in a tantrum. I, I lost again. As I've gotten older and I've played chess with others from time to time, I've found there's something that causes all that inner rage and turmoil to go away in the blink of an eye. When the inevitable has come, you can sense the person who's about to beat you gathering up all the condiments so that as they barbecue you, it'll taste a, a, a really good and tasty meal. They're just ready to just rub it all in. And all you do is you tip the king over and surrender. And all that, that domination that they have stored up inside of themselves just goes away. There is something, friends, in the act of surrender that is so empowering, so deeply gifting to us. Look at all the places in Scripture where the surrendered heart is the victorious heart. God told Samuel when Samuel prayed and said, the people are looking for a king. Every other nation has a king. Every other nation has a beautiful figurehead that they can point to and say, here he is, look at him. He's driving the limo, or he's riding in the back of the limo, and, and he, he, he's showing the wealth of our nation to the world. We need a figurehead like that. We need a king. And God's answer to Samuel initially was, I am your king. The law handed down through Moses and carried into the land by Joshua was a law that was designed so that every citizen bowed not to one another, but to God alone. And the responsibility in that system was for every single citizen to know the law so well that no longer, as Jeremiah said, would they teach one another, saying, know the law, know the law, but they would each take responsibility for themselves. They would be heroes of the faith. In the book of Numbers, in chapter 15, verse 38 to 42, there's a passage of Scripture. It was one of the first exegesis papers I wrote for seminary. They were teaching us a process. Exegesis is just a fancy word for breaking open the word and looking at it. Exegesis. And they said, pick a really tame, innocuous passage so you can practice the process. And so I picked the book of Numbers, chapter 15, verse 38 to 42. Speak to the people of God, Moses, and tell them to uh, put a tassel on the corner of their garment and affix it there with a blue cord. And when they look upon the tassel, it will remind them of all the laws and the statutes and the commandments that I have given you. And it shall be for you a sign. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and will establish you in the land that I have promised to your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Put a tassel on the corner of your garment. These are the kinds of scripture passages that make the casual reader go, whoopee. 
until you realize that in that ancient Akkadian and, uh, and, and Aramaic culture, the only people who wore amulets and tassels with fringes on their garments were the priests, the shamans, the magic men, the people with spiritual power. And the only people who wore blue were royalty. Anybody who saw the nation of Israel marching over the hill and every one of them wearing a prayer shawl that had blue, bright blue tassels, and you've seen them today, the white prayer shawl that goes over the head when you begin to pray and the bright blue tassels on the end of it. They look and they see an entire nation of royal priests. Not a nation led by a royal priest, but an entire nation of royal priests marching right at them. And what gives these royal priests the power that they have to be the priests and priestesses of God? They know the statutes, the ordinance, and the commands of God, and they obey them, and they do not stray from them as their ancestors once did. No, Samuel, I am your king, was the word. Sorry, Lord, but the people are getting restless. Fine. Take Saul. Big and strong, something to look at, but nah, he wasn't quite there. And so along came David, anointed by God. And then one day, David didn't go to war to unite the tribes. He stayed home, and he saw Bathsheba, and eh, maybe not David. And then there was Solomon, and then the kingdom divided, and then on and on and on it went. Until finally God had had enough, and the prophets weren't being listened to, and the seers were being ignored, the, the wise sages and everyone else. And God said, you know what? I'm going to send my son. And the message from the son was, God is taking the kingdom back. God is our king. I'm here to announce it. It has begun now. This is a, these are fighting words of insurrection to any self-respecting government. And so Herod went nuts. How long has this child been alive? Eh, give or take about two years. Fine. Go and worship him, and then afterwards I'll follow and I'll pay my own homage to him. Right. When the wise travelers from the east did not return to Herod but went home because they were warned by God of Herod's treachery, Herod went nuts and he sent the troops down and they slaughtered every single male child under the age of two in Bethlehem. But before that happened, Joseph had been warned in another dream and he went down to, where did he go again? Egypt. Egypt. Egypt, where once a pharaoh was slaughtering all the newborn infants of the Israelites while they were working there. Egypt, which suffered the ten plagues of God in order to clarify where Pharaoh stood on the, on the issue of whether God was God or not. Egypt, which had treated the Israelites so abysmally that they celebrated a Passover for the night in which God smote the Egyptian children and allowed the Israelites to go free. They tell, told stories about it for a thousand years to the time of Christ. How can God's salvation be carried to Egypt? And how is it that the Israelite king can be acting like such a tyrant? He's not Herod anymore, he's Pharaoh. What has happened to us? The whole story of this gospel lesson that was read today is like a giant step backwards for the people of God. Until you remember that sometimes the surrendered moment and the backward step is the best and the most appropriate thing we can do. For to be humbled by God and the circumstances around us is to find God again. Everywhere we look in the scriptures, the people that God is most concerned about are the poor and the marginal and the dispossessed. It's not that God doesn't love those of us who are free to walk wherever we want and say whatever we want and do whatever we want. God loves us too. But the love of God, the heart of God, is especially for the poor, the downtrodden, and the dispossessed. 
God's invitation to those of us who have the choices is make the right choice. Don't just say you love the Lord, but live your love. Carry it out to the world. This is how the kingdom prospers. Surrender to me again and let me be your king, and then God will use us to carry the word forward. I have on my shelf a book written in the mid-19th century about the 18th century mission of John Wesley and Charles Wesley and the others, the history of Methodism as it came to the United States. It's written about 100 years after the fact, though not all of the stories in there are, are likely to be anything more than anecdotes, just, just little stories. But there's a marvelous page in there in which it talks about how, how the Methodists were received in England during the early days of John Wesley's preaching. You know how they were received? With a knock on the head, with riots and rebellions. And every time John Wesley tried to preach, there was a story, he went to St. Ives in the county of Cork to preach in a chapel there. And in the middle of the preaching, the stained glass windows crashed into the building. There were were rocks being thrown through them, and, and people came clamoring in through the back doors and crawled through the windows. They tore up the seat cushions, sent them sailing. They splintered the pews and were carrying them out for firewood. And John Wesley stood in the midst of the people, and instead of saying, fight back, he said, stay, friends, stay and see the glory of God at work. And the people who were mobbing it up in there, who had come to throw the Methodists out onto the street, they, they started picking fights with each other. The whole thing broke down, and the, the whole brawl went back out into the street where they were fist fighting and left the Methodists sitting there. John Wesley wrote in his journal that night, oh, the devil rages horribly, but the word of God runs on and is glorified. Further down the page, an incident from a month later. He was in a different place, and he was preaching. And the local bartender being a good Calvinist and not wanting the Methodists to spread there, took all the coal miners and bought them free drinks for two and a half hours. And then he said, you know what the best thing you can do to serve God tonight is get those Methodists out of here. And with clubs in their hands and cries of knock their brains out, they came racing through the back doors of this Methodist chapel. Twice somebody swung an ax handle at the head of John Wesley. He says, I still don't know to this day how... I was prevented from being struck. But he did get punched in the chest, and he got busted on the lip, and he began to bleed, and he stood there in the midst of it, and he said, Lord God, bless these who have come with passion in their hearts and begin to minister to them. The head of the drunken mob, a local miner, big and burly, looked up and saw John Wesley, a diminutive man, with his arms outstretched, praying for him, and his heart melted. And he came racing up to John Wesley and said, I am your man. And so long as I have a breath in me, no one will touch you. <laughs> and he, he stood there guarding John Wesley for the rest of the event. Oh, the word of God runs on and is glorified, although the devil rages horribly. It is through the surrendered posture through the escape to improbable places like Egypt, through the ministry of angels working with our circumstances. You know, Archelaus is no much better than his father Herod, so uh, would you maybe pick another place when you come back from Egypt? And the dreamer Joseph went to Galilee, and he raised his son. And his son went to be baptized and an angel sent the Holy Spirit to touch his life and into the wilderness he went to confirm his call to win for God a kingdom that will win the world by surrendering to the will of God again and again and again. What are our takeaways from such a story? Number one, 
The church in any generation will only get strong when every single member of it knows the statutes, the ordinance, and the commands of God and does them. What did Jesus say to them on the mount where he was taken up from them? The very last words in Matthew, all authority in heaven and on earth is given now to me. Go, therefore, into all the world, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Did you hear the word in there? Not teach them the things that I taught you, but teach them to obey. When every last citizen of God's kingdom knows the statutes, the ordinance, and the commands of God and obeys them, we catch fire. The church grows strong and mighty. In some generations, mighty in numbers, too vast to count. And in other generations, mighty in power as a small remnant clings to God, proclaims the word, and the word of God runs on and is glorified. There is a time to sow, a time to tend, and a time to reap. Every generation needs to know its work. The reaping is nearly done here at Funko. The time for sowing is not far off. And we will sow in hope, and we will serve the Lord, and we will joyfully bring forth the word that our God is king now and forevermore, that our homage is, belongs to him, and that our hearts shall not be moved whether we are in the stance of upraised arms of praise or bowed on our knees in surrender to God. Our hearts shall not be moved. Amen. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who truly and earnestly love him and are in love and charity with their neighbors and desire to walk in newness of life with Christ from this day and forevermore. On these first two Sundays of the church year, we will be sharing in the sacraments of the church. This Sunday it is communion. Next Sunday is a baptism Sunday. If you know of someone who is desiring baptism, please have them contact the church office and, uh, and we will speak with them about it. If uh, no candidates for uh, baptism are Present next Sunday, we will share in a service of baptism remembrance together so that each of us may renew that baptismal covenant side by side. For this Sunday, a reminder that you are freely invited to this table where we will feast on Christ in our heart by faith and with thanksgiving. And in preparation for that, we'll share our community prayer concerns and we will also make our confession before God and we will share the peace with one another. And in our prayers this week, Ron and Anita Kelly are asking prayers for the uh, family of Joe Venegas, a neighbor and friend who passed away this week. And also word has reached us that longtime FUNCO member Dorothy Clausen passed away on Christmas Eve at her care home in Corona. She loved this church. She watched services, uh, worship. She participated online on her TV. And she had... Uh, uh, our directory and would often send notes of encouragement. Communion teams and Stephen ministry uh, and the United Women of Faith frequently visited with her and uh, helped her feel included. She is a sister and a true member of FUMCO and she is now at home with the Lord and we give thanks to God for giving her peace. Uh, we also had word uh, late this past week that uh, Dick Allen has been in the hospital at St. Joseph's with um, some kind of medical uh, concerns, and uh, I will be heading over there after worship today, but uh, uh, we had no other details from his daughter besides that, so please keep our brother Dick in your prayers as well. 
with these uh, shared concerns in our hearts and pledging to serve God by praying for our brothers and sisters, I invite you now into a prayer of confession side by side. Let us pray. Merciful God, you know the thoughts of our hearts. We confess that we have sinned against you and done evil in your sight. We have transgressed your holy laws. We have disregarded your word and sacrament. So forgive, forgive us, us O oh Lord. Lord. <clears throat> Give us grace and, and power to put, to put away, away all hurtful things. That, that being, being delivered from, from the bondage of sin, we may bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Of repentance. And, and may, may evermore, evermore walk in, in your holy ways. ways. Through, Through Jesus Christ, Christ our, our Lord. Lord. And now, dear friends, may the almighty and merciful Lord grant us forgiveness of all our sins through repentance and change in our lives and the grace and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. We are forgiven in Christ. We are forgiven in Christ. Amen. Amen. I invite you now to stand in body or spirit and to share with one another the peace of Christ. You may say, the peace of the Lord be with you and respond by saying, and also with you. Peace of the Lord be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. Now that you've all sat back down, it's time for aerobics. Stand back up again <laughs> as we sing our hymn of preparation. <laughs> and let's sing together, Christ the Light, the World's Light, hymn number 188. We're doing verse 1 and 4. Today we will be using the spoken responses and the spoken words, uh, the spoken Lord's Prayer for our communion time. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, right to give to our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so with all your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join the unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, 
God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. The Lord of all life came to live among us. He healed and taught, ate with sinners, and won for you a new people by water and the Spirit. We saw his glory, and yet he humbled himself in obedience to your will, pre freely accepting death on a cross. By dying, he freed us from unending death, and by rising, he gave us everlasting life. On the night in which he was given up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, and gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, O oh Lord, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ is, is died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And in the name of your Son, we now share together the family prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, Our Father who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, done on earth as it is, it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us, us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive, forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This bread that we break, is it not a means of sharing in the body of Christ? And when we give thanks over the cup, is it not a means of sharing in the blood of Christ? These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And you are invited now to come and feed on Christ by, in your heart by faith and thanksgiving. The ushers will direct you up the center aisle uh, where you receive a piece of bread to dip into the cup. You are invited to remain at the kneeling rails to pray uh, before returning to your seats by the side aisle. And I would have those who are helping to serve this morning to come forward at this time.
We thank you, Almighty God, that at this beginning of a new year, you feed us with such powerful food and drink to nourish our souls and our spirits, to keep us walking in your path, to transform our souls and spirits into the very likeness of Christ. Loving God, as we rise from this table, may we shed the old sin nature and surrender in love to the command and the call of Christ. May we serve the world in his name. Amen. And stand, and let's go tell it on the mountain. Jesus Christ is born, and a brand new year is born. So here we go. Sing with gusto. and fear in a massive tug of war throughout the ages. And it turns out that those who have the greatest hope surrender, face the fears, and after moving through that season, emerge victorious on the other side. We get there by surrendering. So if you're struggling today in any way, I encourage you to stop fleeing from the struggle Turn and face it head on. The fear of it is much mightier than the actual reality. For God is with us. And above all else, we, we choose, choose Christ. Christ. We choose Christ. Above, above all, all else. So may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, fill your hearts with peace and establish your homes in the grace and the love of God and grant you strength to walk the surrendered path now and always. Amen. Amen.